would stand with me. Take your hymnal. We'll turn to hymn number one. Hymn number one, my Savior's love. We'll sing the first, the second, the fourth, and the last verse. Ready? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end. But sweat drops of blood for mine. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful! And my song shall ever be. How marvelous! How wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very. suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me on the last. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. love for me. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. who's marvelous and who's all-powerful, and we're so glad that you're back here to church tonight. If it's your first time or your first time in a long time, we want to welcome you, especially tonight. Our ushers have a packet. If you'd slip up your hands, they'll get that packet to you. There's a card in there. If you drop it in the plate a little bit later, we'd appreciate it. Well, we're so glad that each of you are here tonight, and we've got several uh, visiting missionary families, and just looking forward to a good night. Our master clubs are back from their master club regionals, and we look forward to hearing what God did there. But let's start tonight with a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we just thank you for the service that we had this morning, the message that we heard, Lord, the lives that were stirred and the decisions that were made. And Father, I pray that you would just tonight, Lord, as we start this service, just bless this time. And Father, I pray that you would help the preaching as pastor preaches about the home tonight, Father, that you would keep Satan from distracting. And Father, that uh, we'd make decisions that would make godly homes. And Father, strengthen this church to do more for you. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Take your hymnal, if you would, please. We'll turn to hymn number 53. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and pour contempt on my pride. Sing, the f- Sing hymn number 53. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain. See 
Or is that on? Let's blame Caleb anyway. Amen? That's what I want to do. Uh, before we get Miss Nancy to come up and uh, talk to us about our Master Club uh, events from the weekend, uh, we've got missions night tonight. We never plan for stuff like this, but it's neat when it happens. Uh, Leroy and Shirley Eldridge. Brother Leroy, where are you at? Back in the back. And good to have you tonight. And then uh, we've also got, uh, let's see. Nope, that's another one. The LaBelles. The Labe- Where are the LaBelles at? Brother LaBelle, good to have you tonight. God bless you, folks. And they're going to Africa. Amen. It's not cool in Africa, so enjoy this. Where are y'all from originally? Oh, well, then you're used to terrible weather. Amen. What a blessing. All right. Good. Abs- yeah, thank you. We appreciate it. Go back home. Amen. What a blessing. Uh, Portland. I-, I follow soccer. You have a great soccer team, the Portland Timbers up there. Love the Timbers. And then we knew uh, that our missionary, Brother Summers, was coming. Not Brother Summers, that's your home church. Uh, I'm reading that, Brother Marowelli. Is that close? Wow, that's a mess. Amen. That's a great first name, Brent. Amen. God bless you. Yeah. But uh, Brother Brent and Miss Shelley from uh, First Bible, and we love First Bible. Uh, Dr. Keene, we go, our families go way, way back with Brother Keene. So we'll meet uh, Brother uh, Brent here in just a moment. But Miss Nancy, I want you to come. And uh, as uh, you know, this weekend was our Master Club Regional Competition up in uh, Pensacola. And uh, the kids left uh, yesterday, or left Friday, excuse me. It seemed like uh, just about a week ago. <laughs> Amen. But uh, they went up and had competition. And uh, then they got in just a little bit ago uh, on the trip back. But uh, I love uh, the kids, I talked to Madeline about the trip and all that, and uh, this is just something that these kids will never forget uh, as long as they live, going up in the big motor coach, Brother Tyler drove up, and then all the events, so Nancy's going to come, and uh, we're going to give out the awards, and she's going to give us a little bit of a report of what went on. I could not have done this alone, and you can tell I'm a little raspy, um, it's rather loud in the gym. And we yell a lot. <laughs> um, I couldn't have done it without all my leaders that went with us. And I certainly appreciate, I, I don't think they regret it at all. Um, Hasina Ramperson, Gloria Kerrigan, June Pendleton, Ann Trigger, Rachel Hott, Jessica Walton, Karen Davis, Dale Davis, and of course our driver who got us there safely, um, Tyler. And we appreciate it so much. We regret that Jason. And Rebecca couldn't go with us because of um, sickness and others that wanted to go but just couldn't. I don't know who enjoys this more, the leaders or the kids. <laughs> um, we have a great time. And this year was um, a little hard on me because one of my arch rivals that I thought I would not ever have to compete against, ever, uh, was there. They drove 11 hours from Austin, Texas <laughs> to be there. And it was good because um, they were some of the people that originally, 28 years ago, got me into Master Clubs. So um, it, was, it was nice to see them and uh, not nice to see them. Um, sort of a mixed blessing. But um, right now I'm going to start... Um, giving out the awards and we'll start with the athletic events and we do have some fun things that everybody can compete in um, 
course, when you're competing against Capital City, it's very difficult to win anything. <laughs> so we did. We got uh, the obstacle course. We got third place. And those people are Sarah, Emily, Faith, Damaris, and Madeline. only athletic event we placed in. Um, the rest of them, I'm very proud to say, were Bible events. And uh, I much prefer those to the athletic ones. Um, we have one competition, it's called Right or Wrong, and it's just general Bible questions, um, and it's a relay, and our team of Erilyn, Madeline, Faith, Sarah, and Damaris placed fourth. And I, if I remember correctly, Capital City had first and second. <laughs> let, me, let me just say that. Brother Thompson is the pastor yes, of Capital City, awesome. Brother Adam. And how many ever remember Karate Kid back in the, back in the 80s? Remember the, the bad guys, the, the Cobra Kai? <laughs> That's Adam Thompson. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. They're wonderful people. And we, uh, they're some of my dearest friends. Um, but they're very competitive. <laughs> Um, the next uh, Bible event that we competed in um, and placed was in the Old Testament themes. These kids learned the themes of all the Old Testament books up through Song of Solomon. And our team placed fourth. And that is Alora, Madeline, Faith, Sarah, and Damaris. Okay, uh, this, this event, um, it's called Where in the Word, and it's all 66 books of the Bible. They don't know which ones the, they're going to choose, but they have to put them in the right category, whether it's the Pentateuch, the history books, the Old Testament prophets, the, uh, the major prophets, minor prophets, and so on, the entire Bible. We placed third, um, Damaris, Sarah, Emily, Faith, and Madeline. Each year, the 4th, 5th, and 6th grade have 30 verses that they are required to memorize. Um, they not only memorize the, what the verse and where it's found, but they also memorize a theme that tells what the verse is about so that they know how to use the verse. Um, and this is the scripture memory, um, and I'm really proud of this one because we got second place beating one of the Capital City teams. <laughs> it's very precious. Um, script, it's Sarah, Alora, Faith, and Damaris. Um, where did the art? Okay. Oh, oh. Okay, thank you. We had um, several students, they have art categories, music, um, crafts, poetry, and our kids did participate, but we're very proud that Faith won, you wanna hold it, sweetie? Faith won first place for her, her, her picture that she did. <laughs> okay. Um, we had, in piano, we had um, three people competing, and Emily plays third. <laughs> now, what I've told you all, to this point have all been team events. They had, it was like a relay. Now, these are individual events where they went into a room and they were timed as how fast they could do, and they had to be fast. Um, we have a third place scripture memory, um, which was Sarah. Um, Sarah also placed third in Bible sequence, which is 20 stories in the Old Testament, which she has to place in chronological order. 
How fast did you do that? You don't remember? We're talking 15, 20 seconds. We're not talking a long time. This is very, very fast. Um, our second place in a Bible event was Alora. She had where in the word. And do you remember what your time was, sweetie? Um, about 16 seconds. <laughs> One of the hardest events to do is Bible quizzing. And we everybody except our third graders competed in Bible quizzing. And um, Damaris about gave me a heart attack. Um, he got about two words out of the question and she was off her pad ready to give him a question that she thought he was going to ask and the answer. She did give a question. It was a correct question. It was a correct verse to go with the question, but it was not the verse he was talking about. So she got an error, but it was awesome. But I know my heart just went, oh. <laughs> but, um. In, in the Bible quizzing, Emily placed third. And she, and Damaris placed first. The highlight of the, the day, and, and I can explain this to you, and Jessica was telling me the other day, she understood what I was saying, how exciting it was, but until you're there and you're holding your breath and you're waiting for them to announce the spirit stick, um, and I'm going to ball, <laughs> um, it's really the highlight because you are voted on by all the other churches that are there and all the master club staff that are there. They choose the one church that demonstrates the best spirit, not just the kids, but the leaders too. And we got it for the second year in a row. These are our little cheerleaders. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not a cheerleader. No, you were a participant. <laughs> I'm sorry, Logan. So, oh, let's give all the big hands, hands, shall we? <laughs> Very proud of you guys. Very good. All right. Thank you so much. This is uh, Wednesday nights when we're all scattered around the campus. Uh, they're up there in the master clubs teaching and working. And uh, these are things I promise they'll remember uh, long, long after they've forgotten other things. They'll remember the verses, the stories, the principles. And um, next year, with the help of the Lord, uh, we're going to work hard and uh, we're going to defeat Capital City. What? We have a video. Oh, you want to show that video, guys? You, are you ready for that? Yeah, I saw that this afternoon. What's that? Oh, thank you,
<clears throat> so next year we will do our best to defeat all those evil other churches. And I mean, just kidding. Anyway, we, when we were all in Texas together, they would come back and it'd be the same thing. We'd do well. Uh, capital City, brother, brother Thompson's dad was the pastor at the time, and now Adam is the pastor. But uh, I would rather our church invest now in the lives of these young people than invest later in our RU programs or our jail programs or these other restoration programs. Try to get them now and uh, get them going. Be excited about that. And I do appreciate all the hard work. I know that the workers uh, have so much uh, to do and try to get ready and uh, just appreciate those children's programs. Uh, the Lord has blessed us with someone. Nancy uh, has been doing this for so many years. Uh, she knows it. She understands it and uh, leads our church with it. So uh, we appreciate that. And uh, get your kids in Master Club. Get your kids in these programs. You'll, you'll find that it will spur you to learn more because they're learning more. And it will be a help to you. It's a great place for you to learn. Let's do this. Brother Brent, I want you to come and uh, say just a word about what the Lord's doing through First Bible. And uh, we're glad that you're here tonight. God bless you, Doc. Amen. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Romans chapter number 15 in your Bibles, if you would, please. Romans in chapter number 15. And let me say, ma'am, uh, where are you that takes care of all the Masters Club? Where'd you go? I go all the way back in Masters Club into the 80s with Brother Ab Thomas and Brother Kirby. Listen to me carefully. Don't walk away when I'm talking to you. Listen, this is important. This is important. I know them personally. Is that not a regional competition? Texas is not in your region. We'll handle that. <laughs> That's out of control. Amen. Don't you agree, preacher? That's out of control. 11 hours is not a region. Well, anyway, that, that's a side note. It has nothing to do with it at all. Romans chapter number 15 in your Bibles, if you will, real quick. And uh, I'm not able to control my PowerPoint like I normally do, so we've got a pro back there on the PowerPoint. Right, ma'am? Yes? So bring it up. <laughs> I have all the confidence in you in the world. I'm positive. Even though you're not doing it, now it's him. All right, Romans 15. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 19. The Bible says, Through mighty signs and wonders... By the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and roundabout into Illyricum. Look at that geography right there. In that entire geography, the Apostle Paul and those working with the Apostle Paul make this next statement. I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Can you imagine with that transportation they had available to them, and with the communication tools they had available to them, they saturated that area with the gospel. Then he goes on to say in verse number 20, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. That's our theme verse for First Bible International, verse number 20. We desire to get the gospel where the gospel has never been before. At First Bible International, our goal is to, is to get the word of God translated into the heart languages of people who have never had a Bible that they can read at all. This is a vision of Dr. Charles Keene. You folks know Dr. Charles Keene, I'm sure. And uh, 10 years ago, he started this ministry in order to get this accomplished. And the reason for that um, is, if we can get the next slide, if I point at you, just go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, we're looking at 6,918 unreached people groups. That's 3.2 billion people, nearly one half of our world's population. 86% of them live in what's called the 1040 window. And that 1040 window is right there. That bottom line is the 10 degree line north of the equator. The top line is a 40 degree line north of the equator from Africa all the way over to the islands. Right there in that imaginary rectangular box, nearly one half of the world's population all live right there. We want to get them a Bible just as soon as we can possibly get them one. We're talking about unreached people groups from Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 where it says we're to go where, church? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where? The uttermost. The uttermost parts of the earth are the unreached people groups. Those are people that have no church, no gospel presence, and no scripture. And what makes it real important is no one's doing anything about it. As far as we know, these unengaged people, there's no active effort in place at all to reach these folks. We want to make a difference in that just as quickly as we possibly can. And that's why we have a purpose at First Bible International. And that purpose, go ahead, and one more time, starts with scripture translate, translation and Bible publishing. Imagine if your scholarly Master's Club kids one of those young people surrenders to become a missionary. God uses them, and they go over to a country as a missionary. They walk through the villages. They knock on the doors of these huts. They want to tell people how to be born again, but they don't have a Bible to show it to them. How difficult would that be? They want to invite them to church, but they don't have the blueprint of what a church is all about. 
Once we can get the Bible into heart language, then we can work with the nationals. And as we work with the nationals, it's been proven that no uh, country has ever been fully evangelized by outside sources. They will evangelize themselves from within. They just need the tools necessary to be able to get the job done. Amen? Then we'll work with the churches, start local churches, and that process repeats itself over and over and over again, as the model is in the Word of God. We have 4,000 missionaries that are sent out from churches, just like this church, around the United States of America. What's interesting, congregation, is where do they go? 85% of those, one more time, are in 15 different countries. Can you imagine that? 85% of all the missionaries in 15 different countries. That might not mean anything to you unless you realize that there's 192 countries recognized by the United Nations. 30% of them are in the same five countries. The most represented countries in all the world for missions are Brazil, Mexico, the United Kingdom, Philippines, and Canada. We need missionaries in those places, amen? If you have missionaries that are coming to your conference going there, we need them going there. We've got missionaries here going to Sierra Leone. We need them going there, amen? But do we need them all going there? We need them going places where they've never been going before. And there's a reason they have not been going there. And I think that I've got a solution for that. If One more time, if you will. How many of you believe in prayer? Fifteen of you. How many of you believe in prayer? <laughs> Wonderful. Now I think we can have a revival in prayer. Psalm chapter 2 and verse number 8. I won't take the time to go there. Trying to get done so a preacher can preach. I'm excited about hearing him preach. Notice it says, ask of me. Now church, I know the context of Psalm chapter 2 and verse number 8. I understand that is, the, that is the son asking of the father. And I know that the father is going to make this happen in his time according to Revelation chapter number 7. However, we've been commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen? Since we've been commanded to go there, we've got a responsibility now to get to as many as we possibly can. I think there's a way we can have that happen. Let me see if I can do this real quickly. How many of you heard of the 1040 window before today? All right. Anybody heard of the 414 window? Good, let me see if I can help you. If you are between the ages of 4 and 14, will you come up here really quick and stand right there on the platform? All 4 to 14-year-olds, come right out up if you can and just stand right over. This is a good photo opportunity, by the way, if somebody has a camera. Seriously, just move right up on the platform on the steps right there and just stand there for just a minute, okay? While they're coming up, a young person surrenders to be a missionary like this young man right here. <laughs> he surrenders to be a missionary. You look like a good-looking missionary to me, so I grabbed you. Somehow, he has got to decide where he's going to go as a missionary, right? And the process that usually happens is he sees a presentation somewhere, either at his church or in Bible college, wherever he is, and God uses that presentation to grip his heart. Many missionaries decide where they're going to go based on what they see. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's certainly okay. But with those numbers, what's the chances that, what's your name? Colin. Colin? Colin or Colin? Colin, what's the chances he ever will even pray about going to an unreached? Not much. But here's how we can make a difference. Let's say that all these young people, you can go ahead right back there. Let's say that all these young people grow up in this church with Sunday school teachers that start teaching them the concepts of the unreached people groups. They start memorizing the 66 countries in the 1040 window. The Sunday school teachers teach that. The preacher prays for an unreached people group on a regular basis from the pulpit. On your beautiful missionary display, you put up a different unreached people group on that display, maybe every month. In your prayer bulletin that you get every week, maybe in that prayer bulletin, you have an unreached people group there. Now what happens? Cullen grows up. How old are you? 13. 13. So for the next five or six years, he grows up here, hearing his Sunday school teacher teach about it, hearing his pastor pray about it. He's memorized the unreached people groups in their countries, he sees it in a prayer bulletin. God impresses upon his heart where to go. What are the chances that Cullen will at least pray about going to an unreached people group? You see, it changes everything. And then if we can get young people all around the country doing that very same thing in 10 years, we could have a host of missionaries going where no missionary has ever gone. You say, why are you saying this particular group? Because of those 4,000 missionaries that are on the field today, there's a statistic out there that tells us 85% of them surrendered to be a missionary between 4 and 14. The prime prospects for missionaries in your church, you're looking at them right here. These are the ones. When that missionary conference comes, we don't want to just send them out of the room so we can have all the adults in here. Your prime prospects are right there. I'm not saying they can't have their own service, but let's make it missionary-oriented. Amen? Amen. Amen, because these are the ones. 
that we believe God can use to make a difference in a quick time to make a difference in these unbelievable numbers. Thank you very much, young people. I appreciate that. Say that verse out loud while they're going back. Would you please? Psalm 2, 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Okay, next slide, please, ma'am. Why is this important? Because all these beautiful people, one more time, are dying without the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ at unbelievable rates. Every second in our known world, church, four people are born, two people die. Every second, four born, two die. If we're already behind by 3.2 billion people, would you agree with me that this is an emergency? In an emergency situation, normal rules of the road cease. Ambulances do not stop at stoplights and stop, and stop signs. The doctors do not call your insurance to find out if your insurance is paid up. The most important thing on their mind is your health. In an emergency, normal rules cease. We're in an emergency situation in our world with a lot of folks that need to hear the gospel. And a line item on the budget is never going to reach them. We've got to go into emergency mode and allow God to do something through us that he would not normally do with us, except we're doing it by faith, believing God to do something amazing. I believe that the answer is found in Psalm 119, 105. You know that verse. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Click it one more time. Thy word is a what? A lamp. One more time. A lamp does what when you turn a lamp on? It glows the area. One more time. It glows the area right around where you're standing. You know what a lamp does, church? A lamp shows you where you are. It shows you where you are. These folks we're referring to have no idea where they are in their lost condition without Christ. They have no idea their sin separates them from God. They have no idea if they don't receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they're going to die and go to a hell they never even knew existed. Can you imagine? But once they get the word of God, that changes everything. They then know their sin condition. They can make a decision with that. Not only is it a lamp, it's also what else? Next slide, please. A light. And the difference in a lamp and a light? A lamp shows you where you are. A light shows you where you're going. You know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. Forty years ago when I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, on that day my name was written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. On that day I was sealed into the day of redemption. On that day a mansion is prepared for me in heaven on the corner of Glory Boulevard and Hallelujah Lane. And I can't wait to get there. Amen? The only reason I know that is because I read about it right here in the book. Amen. Once they get the book, then they have the opportunity to change that. Pastor Tim Berlin says this. What are you doing for the cause of Christ that will outlive you? That's an amazing thought. Is it that little two-by-two two obituary column? If you leave your family enough money to afford to put it in the paper, and it says what? Long-time standing member of, is that all that's going to outlive us? Someone said the greatest missionary we can ever send is the Bible in the mother tongue. That'll outlive us. Amen? And so as you consider your missions conference this year, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, those areas where 99% of our mission money is used to reach those areas, but is that the end of that verse? And unto where? The uttermost, and the uttermost people are who? The unreached people groups, where? Less than 1% of our mission money is used to reach those folks. Less than 1%. And so we pray, Lord of the harvest, we you send forth laborers into your field of service, even from this local church. We believe that what will make a difference in all of these statistics is very simple. It is educating our young people about the need and prayer. We believe prayer makes a difference, do you? We really do. In fact, we have a prayer calendar. This prayer calendar, should you choose to take the challenge to pray, will help you to pray through the top 100 unreached people groups in one month. We've been told in order to form a habit, you have to do something 21 times in a row. If we can get people all over the country praying for 30 days, maybe you'll pray for the rest of your life for the unreached. In fact, if you will take the challenge, if you'll say, you know what, I believe that. I believe prayer does make a difference. If you would join with the thousands of people around the country that are praying for the unreached, for God to make a difference for his glory, would you just stand with me, please? I'll take that challenge. I want one of those prayer calendars. I'll take that challenge, and I'll pray for these folks. Amen. Heavenly Father, you see every person that's standing. And Father, as we on a regular basis lift up the unreached people groups to you in prayer, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would 
turn them from darkness to light. We pray that you would get them a gospel message quickly. Send them a missionary. Father, establish a church in their area where they can worship you. And Father, we pray that many will come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because of people that are praying. When we think of what you did with 12, it's incredible to think what you could do with this many people. So Father, I pray that you'll bless it, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. If you'll come by the display table uh, right at the conclusion of the service, I'll be glad to give you one of these, one per family if you would, please. We'll be glad to get those to you and see the other things that are there. Uh, also, very interesting, a lot of children in here, uh, Brother Byron Fox has got these CDs out there uh, that helps the kids to memorize the Bible to music. My wife makes these beautiful scripture frames. They're just King James verses, beautifully done on frames that it helps us to get from point A to point B with gas. Amen? Thank you for the opportunity. I've been wanting to say this a long time. Thank you, Brent, for having Brent in your Amen. pulpit. Amen. <laughs> Got to stick together. Amen. We were in Sunday school this morning, and uh, in our we have the new members class, and we were in the office there talking, and uh, we're talking about the missions conference. And I, I asked the guys, I said, how many of you know what a missions conference is? And, of course, uh, new members, new Christians, they had no idea. So I had the privilege to walk down through just faith promise missions and mission support and uh, getting them excited for the conference. I hope and pray uh, that you're starting to get excited about the conference and uh, meeting new missionaries and, and, and just being challenged. Uh, the technology we have there is such a neat thing. Uh, I, I'm able to talk to, through Twitter and other things, missionaries that are on the field, going to the field, and uh, just, to, just to hear some of the, like he talks about, some of the new frontiers that are being broken, uh, where we have one missionary that we, we are excited about coming in. Uh, they're going into Egypt, and, uh, you know, that's just not a place you hear a lot of missions. Now, that wasn't always so. There used to be, years ago, there used to be a, a push into those uh, Holy Land regions, and now because of the Muslim threat and so on, we've pulled back. But places like Singapore and Indonesia and places where the Muslim influence is so strong. Uh, but it's, it's exciting. There are being some young men and women that are going into these cultures. And uh, that, that's part of it. We're, of course, United Kingdom and Philippines, all the ones he, he talked about that we have missionaries in. That, that's a blessing, partly because so many can be won there and sent into their home countries. And that's one of our goals as well is to train folks here in the States. It may come from these regions, but prayerfully send them back if the Lord allow their heart to be touched to go to their own people groups. And so missions has got to be. Uh, Oswald Chambers made the statement, I think is the greatest one of outside the Word of God statements. When a church uh, no longer is involved in missions, it forfeits its right to exist. And uh, really, that's, that's what it's all about, is missions here uh, through Bible clubs and our children's program. Uh, again, just tying that all together, we have an open door in Boca Ciega to get in and be mentors for these young men and women. Starts right here. Some of you need to be involved in that and uh, working with us trying to reach these unsaved uh, high school students. Our public school Bible club, that's missions in the local public high schools and junior high schools. And then, of course, our buses and our children's programs and 226 and all that. And then as the Lord touches our hearts there, we open up into these unreached people groups and around the world, whatever the Lord has our heart to do. So let's pray Pray about our conference. Dr. Keene uh, is uh, really, for our generation, has uh, been one to lead the drumbeat as far as uh, four missions and for uh, the 1040 window. And they're very familiar with First Bible and the work there. Also, we have our missionaries to Africa tonight. Get to meet these folks and uh, say hello to them. But uh, let's do this. Gentlemen, you come on and take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 2. Genesis, chapter number 2. We're in our fourth or fifth, I think it's fourth or fifth, sermon series tonight uh, on home improvement. And uh, tonight I want to talk to you about the basis of what a family is for. What's a family for? Well, we've talked about several things. You have your notes tonight. You can follow along and... Uh, you know, we just came out of, and by the way, may I say this, uh, I believe that last weekend's family conference with Dr. Davis probably was one of the best things we've ever done for our church. Uh, Brother Davis was a blessing to my wife and I, uh, some principles we learned, some things that we learned. Uh, I pray some things you learn and uh, some things that you're going to work on and try to improve. 
Uh, Brother Davis has got all those resources. By the way, First Bible, I was going to mention that a moment ago, their website is one of the best websites out there for information about missions and missionaries as well. So check out their website. But Brother Davis helped us last week. Uh, how many of you think you got it all figured out and then somebody shows you you don't really have it all figured out? And uh, just some things we learn. I learned some things as a pastor and learned some things as a husband and father. And so uh, I don't know that we cannot spend more time on the family because I think the strong family will produce the strong Christian, which will be the missionary or the teacher or the pastor. And fellas, if we're investing in anything, it ought to be in our families. And moms, if we're investing in anything, it ought to be in our families. And so uh, this ought to be the priority. So tonight, uh, give me uh, just a few moments. I I plan not to be long at all. I'm going to try not to be long at all. But I want you to look at verse number 18. Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him help me. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused Adam, uh, the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he, uh, uh, me, made he woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, now this is interesting to me, God just makes him. There is no father-in-law or mother-in-law, and yet he makes the statement, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and thus shall be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. The law of prime mention, if you have, we mentioned this in Sunday school this morning, the law of prime mention is whenever you find the first principle given about a subject, Normally, throughout the rest of Scripture, that is the principle by which you go by to determine the meaning of something. And so in the law of prime mention, you would say, well, here's the first man and woman coming together as wife. And so while there is no mother-in-law or father-in-law, God goes ahead and lays out in the first mention of husband and wife. He says, now, once you find a spouse, once you find a wife, you leave your father and mother, and now you cleave unto your wife, unto your spouse, and you now are one flesh. And so we find in the law of prime mention, God says, this is the order of marriage. Now, how many of you understand, and you know you do, you have to understand, marriage is under assault by every direction. Uh, It used to be said in this country that a marriage was under assault from just the far left. And uh, we would say, well, uh, the movies and the television, and it gets progressively worse the longer we live in this wicked and perverse generation. But now marriage is assault uh, under assault from the highest authority in the land. When the president of the United States speaks on a subject, whether we agree with him or not, what he says has merit and weight because people listen. Never before has there been such a president that has been so anti-God family and pro-homosexual family. This president is now setting precedent by his decisions, laws, and action. We have never seen ever in your lifetime ever the home under such assault. Then you take it from the president, you add with that the culture, you add with that the weakening of the church. And let me explain, the family structure is on life support in many places. The family is in a difficult predicament. I just read an article this afternoon uh, from a marriage, uh, a a pro-family marriage, a pro-family organization, a marriage first organization. And they said this, people that cohabitate before marriage are far more likely to divorce than people that don't. Now, what's the number one thing today? We're not going to get married. We're going to live together. And so you have people living together who then get married, but statistically, they are far more likely to divorce than those that didn't live together first. So guess what we're doing? We're weakening the family further. The sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s weakened the family. The culture weakening the family. Television and movies 
Always portraying the strong family, especially if there's a Christian in the family, portraying them as the strange, the weird, the outcast or oddball, while the modern family is whatever you want to call a group of people living together. As goes the family, goes the church. As goes the church, goes the community. As goes the community, goes the nation. Is there any reason or is there any question why America is in deep peril? Our families are whacked out. We're, we're under a mess. So what's the answer? The answer is found in God's Word. God's Word says, here's the family. By the way, God's Word defines marriage. We, we, have, we have all these crazy questions about what constitutes a marriage. Why are we asking a question that God's already defined? So so if you want to go back and figure out where did we get off track? Was it the 60s? Was it the 70s? Was it the 80s? Was it the 90s? The 2000s? Listen, we got off track in the Garden of Eden. And from then till now, until the Lord tarries us coming, the devil is going to be attacking the home. So what must we do? We must go back to the beginning and say, God, help us to establish and order our homes after the principles and precepts of the Word of God. I want to give you five principles tonight that I hope will help you. What is the purpose of a family? Fellas, your wife is more than just a maid. She's more than just someone that you pop in and out. Young people, the family is more than just a place you spend the night before you go to the next thing. It has purpose. Number one, God ordained the family to be a shelter for and in the time of storms. God ordained the family. This family unit is the core relationship dynamic you will ever have. And and, and you say, Pastor, why is it so important uh, that we have a shelter for storm? Because the Bible says the fear of the Lord is a strong confidence and children shall have a place of refuge. Now, I come, and you know the story, I come out of a divorced home. I'm the product of a divorce home. Now, thankfully for me, the divorce came in my later teen years, not in my formative young years, but it was as a teenager. Many of you understand what I'm talking about. And you understand this. When there is no home to turn to in a storm, there is no fear like that fear. I remember when my parents went through the divorce thinking it will never be right again. There, there'll never be that, that home. People say, oh, we're going to go home. For us, home fractured. And there never was that place. And, and now, thankfully, the Lord has been good and that he's met every need and he's provided in so many ways. But when that storm comes, the first inclination we have is run to a safe place. And for many of us, the sweetest and best memories we have were of home and childhood and those precious memories that we carried with a mom and a dad. And we run there. And even now, we call mom on the phone. We call dad on the phone because we have a problem. We have an issue. We have a struggle. Where do we run? We run home. We run to daddy. We run to mama. And God ordained that because, listen, life is full of storms. The primary place God gave us to shelter, to give us refuge, to strengthen us in time of storm was the home. Why did God do that? Because God knew life's tough. Some of you, listen, you got to wake up a little bit. Some of you need to come out of the Pollyanna world that you live in. Life's not easy. Life, Life gets harder. There's some difficulties out there. Some of you don't want to grow up because you think, if I, you're like Peter Pan, if I don't grow up, I'll never face responsibility. Listen, you have to grow up. You, 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 you can't just stay in a vacuum. You've got to send We deal with the, our single adult conference. We deal with a lot of single adults through our ministry. And, and you know what they tell me? They tell me, Pastor, I don't want to do that. And I say, why don't you want to do that? Say, I'm scared. So? I'm scared. I'm scared. But guess what? I have to go forward. Here's the things that people are afraid of, the storms they're going to face. They're going to face the storm of change. The storm of change. I I have a place in my mind I go to that all was well. It was prior to 1977. I was born in 68. Up until 1977, I lived in Camelot. Now, I know in my mind that it had problems But they didn't affect me. Sometime in the middle of 1977, 
And I don't remember the actual date, but I remember the moment clearly. I'm, I'm sitting piano side, fourth row back. Dr. Hudson got up and made his resignation from Forest Hills. At that moment, Camelot, for me, ended. Dr. Hudson went into evangelism. One year later, we moved from Atlanta, Georgia, to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And it hasn't stopped changing since. Now, from 68 to 77, I lived in the perfect world. I had a great pastor. I had a great church. had great friends. We played. We ran to campus. We knew every secret place in the church. Our parents were there all the time, so we were at church all the time. And we had very little supervision. Say amen right there. I mean, life was great. And then it changed. And then guess what? It changed again. And then it changed again. And then in 1986, I graduated. Then 1987, my parents busted up. And then I got a new stepmom and I got a new stepdad. And then my parents uh, moved. And then my sister got married. And then my sister got divorced. And then I, I went off to college or went off to the military. And from, from 77 until right now, life has changed. And by the way, it won't be this way again. We have a little saying in our family, it'll never be this way again. Because my father wanted to drive in our minds, you can't live right here. You have to be always moving forward because life moves forward. And some of you are like, what do I do? Well, that's why the home is so important. It's going to be hard enough for them as they go into new challenges and go into new difficulties. They've got to have some place stable that they can say, no matter what else changes, mom and dad still love the Lord. Mom and dad are still in their place. Number one, they're going to face not only the storm of change, but the storm of failure. I would love for our kids to all have blue ribbons after competition. I'd love to call Brother Thompson on the phone and in Christ-like tender, loving mercy say, no, 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 we beat you. But the truth is you don't win everything you try. The truth is you fail. The truth is you're going to give it your best shot and sometimes your best shot's not enough. I I reject the idea that nobody gets A's and F's because that's not life. This idea that everybody passes. No, somebody somebody passes. I reject the idea that everybody makes the team. Uh, Back when I played sports, you tried out, and if you didn't make the team, you didn't make the team. Now everybody makes the team. And by the way, some leagues have gone to we don't even keep score anymore. That's just not life. Sometimes you go for a job interview and you have the best answers and you're on top of your game. And yet the person next to you gets the job and you did your best. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, hello. Life's hard. And sometimes you'll try really, really hard and it'll still not be good enough. And you'll not get the job or you'll not get the promotion or you'll not get the guy or you'll not get the girl or whatever. And you need to run somewhere safe and say, what happened? I failed. And that's why you need a home. Because you need a place of refuge, a place that you can go and say, Dad, what did I do wrong? And Dad put his arm around you and say, you didn't do anything wrong. That's just life. <laughs> My daddy, he's, he's such an encourager. I'll call him, I, I feel like calling him tonight. I'm going to say, Daddy, it's so hard being the pastor. And Daddy, this and that. And he'll say, Son, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And I'll, I'll be thinking, You're not a comforter, but you know what? That is comforting because he'll tell me the truth. He'll tell me what I need to hear. He'll help me get through the next time and the next thing. Why? Because life's full of storms. Life's full of failure, full of change. Number three, rejection. Rejection. Life's full of rejection. You're going to do what you think is best, and somebody's not going to like it. You're going to make a decision, and somebody's going to make another decision. Those decisions are going to be opposed to each other, and you're going to find that people you trusted and people you loved and people you cared about rejected you. Families are a shelter because when everybody else says no to you, you know who always says yes? Mama loves her boy. Now, mama may be mad at him, but don't you get mad at him. Daddy may not be in agreement with him, but don't you not being agreeing with him because no matter what else mama and daddy they're gonna look it's funny to me I've been pastoring long enough now that I don't care if you're 70 years old if you have a 50 year old son you still treat that child like he's your little bitty baby boy I'm 44 years old I have a wife have four kids pastor a church that runs four or five hundred and I call my dad on the phone and says hey boy I'm boy my first name not Brent not John boy it used to be get wood but now it's boy but it's amazing that no, no matter what anybody else thinks about you, 
Mom and dad are going to love you. And God designed that. God designed that for a mom and a dad to provide a loving, sheltered environment. And that's why I don't understand homes of chaos and turmoil. Because if anywhere else needs to be a safe haven, a safe place, an encouraging place, a receptive place, it ought to be the home. Why? Because life's hard enough outside the home. That's why I, I'm worried about you folks that like to live in chaos and noise and anger. That ought to be the safe place because these problems ought to be outside the home, not inside the home. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. If they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he hath not another to help him up. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken Uh, there's going to be times when the kids go off to master club and they do their best and they don't get a ribbon but you know what they come home and mom dad say it doesn't matter if you get a ribbon or not I still love you I'm still proud of you you're still my kid and and they cheated no I'm just kidding (laughs) let me give you four practical ways to turn your home into a safe place a shelter time of storm number one learn to hear not just listen. Learn to hear, not just listen. I'm afraid that I listen without hearing more than I hear without listening. It's one thing to to hear the noise, and sometimes the kids can make a lot of noise, and the wife, the husband make a lot of noise, but, but we need to learn to hear what's being said. A lot of times kids don't know how to tell you what they're thinking. They'll tell you a lot of things, but if you are a careful listener, you'll hear what you need to hear. Maybe they didn't even tell you what they wanted to tell you, but you can hear it. You'll find out. By the way, ask them. Have a home. That thing that Brother Davis said about about the uh, family dinner. Listen, implement that in your home. Have a place where on a regular basis there's a sit down, where there's a conversation. And you say, well, we tried that. It didn't work. Try it again. And try it again and try it again and make it happen because there's going to come a time when they want to talk. And listen, they better be able to talk to mom and dad because if not, somebody will slide in and give them some bad information. Number two, not only here, but hug. And he talked about that physical touch, how important that is, how that the, the, the young people in our world have been so uh, trained and so taught and, and so twisted when it comes to the idea of love. We need to teach them about pure love and, and, and about the right kind of love and, and not where they're starving for attention that they'll take it from the wrong boy or girl or what have you, but they didn't know that dad loves them. And, and sometimes it's interesting, a, a hug will go a long way to solve a problem. Sometimes a pat on the back or a pop on the bottom or whatever it is, but physical affection number three we need to learn to help but listen without enabling without enabling i want to help my kids i'm not going to enable my kids my father though the thing that that i learned from him uh, that i want to help my kids with is i will help you but i'll not do for you what you need to learn to do for yourself because listen dads there's going to come a time when you're not there to help and if you've not prepared them, now, now listen, I'm not for throwing them out to the wolves. I want to help them. I want to provide for them. But at the same time, help them while teaching them how to do for themselves. Because it's going to come a time. I was counseling a few days ago, a few weeks ago. And I said to somebody, I said, if you don't do this now, what's going to happen when you're gone? And by the way, I'm not talking about a 17-year-old. I'm talking about a 27-year-old son. And a mom and dad were having to make some tough decisions. And I said, listen, mom and dad, you got to do this now because if you don't do this now, there's going to come a time when you won't be able to come back and do. And then what's going to happen to this child, who no longer, by the way, is a child? Help them. Be an encouragement to them. Be a provider for them. But also let them step out and let them realize that life is difficult and they're going to have to work hard and they're going to have to have some tools in their toolbox to succeed. Help them But quit enabling them. It's interesting. We pastor, obviously, senior citizens. And by the way, we love the seniors. If you didn't get a CD this morning, make sure you get one tonight uh, for Senior Appreciation Day. But at the same time, it's sad to me that I'm still watching some 70, 80-year-old men and women enabling their 40 and 50-year-old children. You're going to die one of these days. And then who's going to step in if you don't teach them to fend for themselves now? Number four... Hear them, hug them, help them, give them hope. 
Let those children know that they are fearfully and wonderfully made and special in the sight of God and can do anything God puts in their heart. Listen, we need to produce in our children an understanding that with God everything is possible and that you believe that with God they can do whatever God calls them to do. And we need to have a home that is a hopeful home, a home that is an encouraging home. Listen, if God were to call you to missions, don't be a a, a wet blanket. Don't be a discourager if that's God's call. Be an encourager about God's call. At the same time, if God's called them to learn a trade like plumbing or like electrical work or whatever else, be an encourager. But let them know whatever God does in your life, I'm okay with that as long as you have a heart for God. Most important thing you and I can do for our children is let them know to have a heart for God. Whatever vocation they have, make sure that their first principle or priority is to do it with all their heart for the glory of God. So many times I find myself being negative, and I have to be. Parents learn the word no before we learn anything else. We learn the, no, we learn the word no in multiple languages. We can signal the word no without using our lips. I mean, finger snaps and eye looks and pinches, and we can say no a multitude of ways. We have to look and work hard at saying yes. Statistically, for every no, there should be a multiple of yeses, a multiple of encouragement. For every time we have to push down, we need to work harder to lift up. Why? Because we don't want our children always being pushed down because the devil's pretty good at that. We need to be encouragers and, and advocates and say, you can, by the grace and glory for the glory of God, do whatever God's called you to do, a place of hope, a place of encouragement. Listen, work hard to look for ways to say yes. Number one, the family as a shelter in the time of storm but number two the family is to be the learning center for life now let me give you this very clearly the number one place that your children are to learn is at the feet of the parent then the church then the outside education do not give the responsibility of educating your children away that's one of the great responsibilities we have as parents is to teach our children all right pastor spiritually you take them all right school district educationally you take them no they're your children you take the responsibility to teach them the majority of life lessons they're going to learn i i think that sometimes i i say too much i, I know i do i've got to got to be careful but I, you, you hear me say it almost every sermon, daddy said, or daddy said, or Freed said, or, or whatever. Well, why is that the case? Because the great lessons of life I learned from my father. And I'm not embarrassed about that. I'm glad about that. Sometimes I learned hard lessons that, that, that I, I would like to not have learned. But uh, uh, two by four is not a good tool for spanking. But anyway, uh, I want you to realize that God gave your children to you. Not to the school board or to the Christian school or not to the pastor or the youth pastor. God gave them to you. The Bible says that Psalm 144 and verse 12. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as a cornerstone polished after the similitude of the palace. The family is a garden for growing people. The Bible encourages fathers to provoke not our children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. A lot of training is learning which end of the child to pat. Sometimes the head, sometimes the bottom. But learning to teach your children. The goal of of parental training is kind of like this. I want them in the beginning stages to be under my control. You know, up to a point. Because I'm the daddy works. Why are we doing that? Because I said so. You know, I'm not going to... Listen, if you're arguing with a three-year-old, you've already lost the battle. If you're trying to explain the difficulties of life to a two-year-old, two-month-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, you're wasting your time. Listen, daddy said so, that's enough. At some point, you want them to learn self-control. By the way, parents... When you don't bring them into the Sunday evening service, you're not teaching them self-control. Any child can sit still for an hour. If they can't, take them out, deal with them, bring them back in. It's a learning process. You know what they're learning? They're learning self-control. 
They're, they're learning that there's reward for doing well and there's a punishment for not doing well. So they go from my control to self-control. Uh, after a while, your children ought to be able to listen for an hour or whatever the number is. Uh, they ought to be able to sit still. They ought to be able to obey. They ought to learn some self-control. Stop wrestling with terrorists. Trying to get a child to do. Teach them to have self-control. But listen, that's not the primary goal. We dealt with this on Thursday night in RU. The primary control is to move them from self-control to spirit control. Now, my goal as a dad is not when my son is 17, 18, 19 to still have him under my control. I realize that's futile. Even now, uh, there's so much of Quinn and Con's life that, that is not in my control. They're gone. They're out. They're doing. I can't control them anymore because I'm not with them 24-7. Now, when you have a newborn, you're with them all the time. You can control everything, and you need to control everything. But after a while, they need to learn self-control. Because, listen, whether they serve God or not, I don't want them to throw their life away by getting in trouble and doing something wrong. Self-control. But ultimately, I want spirit control. So that whether dad's there or not, whether there's police there or not, they know that God is always there. And parents, you gotta, you gotta have a you gotta have a plan. If you think you're gonna take your child from, from zero to sixty and walk him hand in hand or walk her hand in hand all the way through life. No, sir, there's going to come a time, and there's different stages. Dr. Davis made a big deal about 12 years old about the Lord Jesus Christ. There were those seven principles that he had in his life there. And then, of course, later in life, 20 years of age, according to the Bible, is the age of manhood. That's when the children of Israel were counted in the wilderness that they could choose where they would serve the Lord or not. That's the age of war. I just read through all that in Leviticus about those 20 years old and upwards. That's the age of adulthood where they're, they're now before God capable and ready to make their own, own decisions and they're held accountable for their decisions. If you haven't got your child prepared by 12 and 15 and 17 and 20, what are you going to do the rest of their life? The goal is to move them through the process. I want my kids to at some point stop asking what would daddy do and start asking what does the Lord want me to do? Jesus gave us a glimpse, 12, Luke chapter 2, verse 52. The Bible says he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Wisdom he grew intellectually. Stature he grew physically. In favor with God he grew spiritually. In favor with man he grew in social development. So there's intellectual growth, there's physical growth, there's spiritual growth, and there's social growth. Uh, folks, I, I don't want to take time. You know what, I do want to take time, I actually do change my mind your children need to finish school <laughs> you think that's funny okay pastor what are you going to preach preach a deep spiritual truth if you're going to homeschool them the key words in that sentence are school at home don't do them a disservice if you can't get them trained get them in a place to get them trained Brother Paul, am I saying anything that needs not to be said right here? Your kids got to go to school. Okay? We live in a culture. We live in a world where, and that, back when my daddy quit school in eighth grade, some of you old timers, y'all quit school, eighth grade, ninth grade. Well, pastor, it worked for me. Yeah, a house was $19,000. You know, $9,000. A car was $50 a, a month, whatever. That's not life anymore. Even if they're going to work, it's amazing to me. We, we've got young people. I, I used to think the answer was the military. So I had some kids last year. Paul and I took a young man, 19 years old. Uh, we took him to the recruiter. Now, when I was in the service, it went like this. Coast Guard's the hardest to get in. Air Force was the next hardest to get in. Marine Corps was the next hardest. Or Navy, then Marine Corps, then Army. Bottom line, and I'm not, not being unkind, but... Back in my day, if you could sign your name and you were not completely obese or failed the drug test, you could get in the Army. I mean, that was just the bottom line. 
So we took a young man, Paul and I, drove a young man to the recruiter. We walked him in. We said, this young man wants to turn his life around. He needs to get in the Army. And they said, have you graduated high school? And he said, no. They said, uh, do you have any GED experience? He said, no. <clears throat> they said, well, even if you had a GED, you would need one or two semesters of college because we no longer even accept GEDs to get in the Army. And some of your kids, I love you, but they're not graduating. We're homeschooling, but there's very little, there's more emphasis on home and not much emphasis on schooling. Get some help. Get them through. They need to grow intellectually. Number two, they need to grow physically. Fat people are not pleasing God. Now, I can say that because I know I've got to lose weight. But our body is a temple, and my uncle and I, we, he, he shared with his church that, that he knows us in there. Listen. Don't die of a heart attack. That's not being a good steward of your body. Work at this. We've got to work at this. Appreciate some of you that are. But work at this. Grow physically. Get your kids off the stinking Xbox and get them outside. Get them on a bicycle. Get them on a basketball court. Get them on a soccer pitch. Get them out. I, I love it, man. Me and Steve are out there kicking with the kids. And while our heart attacks are taking place, our children laugh at us. Get them outside. Get them running around. Get them outdoors. I don't, do y'all remember what the outdoors were? I remember the outdoors. Now, I know it was a different time. We didn't have to worry about the crazy people next door and all that. But, but we used to be gone all day and all night. And, and if we came home safe, great. If we came home at all, it was good. Our parents, nowadays, where's the kids? Bedroom or computer room is almost the answer for everything. My wife has hidden, this is a true story, my wife has hidden the Xbox controllers in our house right now. And you think it's for the kids. <laughs> I'm having call of duty withdrawal, man. I'm, she said the other day, she said, I'm sick to death of every boy in my house at the Xbox. So we don't have controllers right now. Don't amen that, that's bad. <laughs> Y'all talk to my wife about getting right with God. But you know what it's done? Men and the boys have been playing more basketball. We've been out more. Listen, I'm hurting physically more, but I know it's better for me. So he grew physically. Number three, spiritual growth is the most important growth we can encourage in our kids. It's stuff with Master Club. This isn't just something we do on Wednesday night. By the way, if we cut Master Clubs out of our budget, we'd save a lot of money. We'd save a lot of resource, a lot of time. But listen, I believe in teaching our children the Word of God. We must invest spiritually in our children. We, we sent our kids to a youth rally yesterday. That, that wasn't because we didn't want to do something else. That's because we realized they've got to get around other young people. They've got to learn the word of God. They've got to be encouraged to serve the Lord. We must encourage spiritual growth. Check on your children's Bible reading. Talk to them about the message. Talk to them about Sunday school. How was Sunday school? Now, your kids, if they're, if they're 13 or 16 like mine, how was Sunday school? Fine. So you have to make a follow-up question. What did you learn about in Sunday school? The Bible. What specifically did you learn about in the Bible in Sunday school? Jesus. What about Jesus? And it may take you 20 minutes to get more than fine. But listen, teach them the value and encourage to them the importance of the Word of God. Growing spiritually. A service project. Part of Master Club, by the way. Doing service projects. Doing things for others. When's the last time you took your child on a visit with you? When's the last time you made a visit would be a better question. Second question is, when's the last time you took a child with you to make a visit? To invest in someone else's life. To do something for someone else. To invest in a soul winning opportunity or an encouraging opportunity. Teach them physical things, but more importantly, teach them spiritual principles. That's it, guys. That's what it all boils down to is do your children have a heart for God or not? Do they, do they understand a love for mission? I, I love sports. You know I love sports. And whoever defiled my car today with all that Florida Gator stuff, I am really going to get you when I find out. Somebody, me and John Allen, we're minding our own business. Park, go worship God. Come out of church this morning. And somebody wrote Florida Gator. Brooke, where were you at this morning? Yeah, watch it, watch it. But, but. 
I love all that, but I don't care about uh, any sports hero. I don't care about any uh, worldly entertainment person, but I do understand the value of teaching my kids to love pastors and preachers and missionaries and Christians and instilling in them a love for the work of God. It, it, it's just, we're, we're so backward nowadays. And then we ask the question, what happened to our kids? Well, did we as parents teach them spiritual truth? Did we as champ, ch- parents, when it came missionary conference time, uh, really teach them what faith promise mission was, what the 1040 window is, what it is about to get the Bible? They, they take for granted that everybody's got a Bible. They have no idea the dearth of the word of God around the land. But we talk a lot about the walking dead and the Grammys. And the All-Star Game, and our president, and Fox News, but we're not investing spiritually. And then we wonder why our kids aren't spiritual. It's not really hard to find out what's important in your home. Number four, favor with men, social development. I'm not going to uh, belabor this, but um, teach your children how to talk to people. Teach your children how to interact. I shook hands with a gentleman, Basil, sitting about there this morning. There's a fella right behind where Basil was sitting. And I, he's an older man. I shook his hand. He liked to broke my hand. And I said, man, I like that good firm handshake. He lit up. I said, we need to teach these young people how to shake a hand. And they get the little pansy handshakes and won't look at you in the eye. And listen, teach about social interaction. Look at, look at somebody in the eye when they talk to you. Look, look at somebody uh, when they say hello to you. Say hello to them. But I tell my children, use your, use your big voice. You know, how are you? Well, I'm fine. No, talk to people. Listen. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Hold door. Open. Pull chair out. Not when they're sitting down. Social graces. We, we used to call that home training. Any of you ever got popped in the mouth for not having a yes ma'am or a no ma'am? Oh, yes ma'am. That's what, I mean, now it's maybe southern, I don't know. Use guys, whatever y'all said up north. But home train, social interaction. Our, our children, and, 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 maybe, and you know, we, we, uh, we make the homeschool jokes. A lot of us homeschool, that's fine. But we make the homeschool jokes that, that homeschool children, uh, they, they use big words and all that. Listen, if you homeschool, that's fine. Teach them how to be normal with other kids. Put them in soccer program. Put them in an activity where they have to interact with kids. And they're not speaking, you know, on a 12th grade level and they're in second grade. That's weird. Okay? The other kids, teach them how to function. That's why, again, master clubs, soccer, these things it, it helps them learn social skills. By the way, we're social people. We're social beings. Interaction is important. What we learn from our family, we learn relationships from our family. We learn character from our family. We learn values from our family. These are things that we must teach our children. We must teach our family. We must teach our children. Number three, the family is a place to play. I'll quickly give you these and be done. Number three, the family is a place to play. Make your home the home they want to go to. Invite kids over. I, my wife and I laugh. We, we don't enjoy having all your children over, but I'm glad when they come over. Now, I don't mean that badly, but we have to pick up and straight. Y'all, y'all know what I mean. I love to have your kids over, but we got to clean up afterward. But by the way, I'd rather that happen than them not want to be home. My, my home... My father was a workaholic. He thought everybody around him needed to be a workaholic. Uh, the activities when people came over to my house, such exciting events as post hole digging, fence building, hay cutting, baling, and stacking. Nobody wanted to come over to my house ever. The only person that ever wanted to come over to my house was Glenn Ford because he didn't have a father. He loved my father. And I thought about this many times. I'll go live at your house. You come live at my house. Because that was all we did was work. No, everybody said, like, let's do something. I said, come over to the house. They said, no, Brent, you come to my house. Listen, we want your kids at our house. And by the way, uh, we want them to enjoy being at the preacher's house. We want them to enjoy being around. And I want my kids to enjoy being at our house. Listen, dads, you got to make it a place. Moms, you got to make it a place where they want to be. I could preach that for a long time. I... <clears throat> Number four, 
the family is to be a launch pad for the ministry. I, I, I grew up in a preacher's home. I learned a lot about the ministry. I learned a lot of, a lot of uh, the good things, the negative things. But I, I know that, uh, I know I want my kids to know the, the local church, the ministry of Christ, the local church is it's the most important thing they could ever be involved in. No matter what else they do, besides that, this is the most important thing, whether they're a doctor, a lawyer, policeman, fireman, plumber, or whatever, but the ministry of the local church. Minister with your children, not at the expense of your children. Take your kids with you. Take them to, nothing will open a door like a little person at a nursing home or a visit. People may be rude to you. They ain't going to be rude to Damaris or Phoebe. They're going to be like, yeah, come on in. You minister with your children, not at the expense of your children. That's one thing my father-in-law taught me as a missionary uh, with with, uh, Valerie and, and the family. Work with your kids. Take them to the nursing homes. Take them on the bus routes. Take them into the public schools with you. Minister with them. Number five, the family is to be a channel of blessing. Now, we learned a lot about this last week. But the Bible talks about uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Heirs together of the grace of life. Brother Davis explained all this in detail. I'm not going to go back and rehearse what he gave us last week. But he made a very clear statement on Friday night about breaking family curses and starting family blessings. And uh, many of us, after that Friday night message, we were looking at our fathers and our grandfathers, and we were looking at ourselves, and we were seeing patterns had been established, and uh, we were seeing manners. I walked into a preacher's meeting a few weeks ago, and uh, I just walked in the door, and the guy looked up at me and said, that's John Stansel's boy right there. And I said, how'd you know? He said, number one, you look like him, you walk like him, and you talk like him. It's just, just the mannerism. I didn't plan that, but that's who I am. Well, the same is true with blessing, and the same is true with cursing. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you didn't come from the right kind of family? Let me encourage you, start a family that can pass down a blessing. I love the fact that I can tell my boys and Madeline that their grandpas on both sides love the Lord. And that their grandmas were actively involved in work and ministry. And that we can trace that back to Valerie's grandpa's dad. Or our kid's grandpa, dad, Valerie's grandpa, who said to his wife, Miss Stella, we're going to go to church. And so grandpa where, and now papa where, and now us, and prayerfully, my sons and daughters. And what God does is what God does. But the point of the matter is, let them see that there is a benefit and a blessing to being a family right with God. Now, the opposite is true, and I, I want you to understand this. You get mad at God, you get bitter at God, you get angry with God. You say, preacher, why are you preaching that we're all in church? Because it doesn't take a lot for you to get bitter. It doesn't take a lot for you to get out of church. I know a family, they were out of church 12 years, got back in church, and now since about 07, they've been out of church again. It doesn't take a lot to get in and get out. And your children are raised with whatever mentality you give them about the things of God. If it's a priority to you, it's a priority to them. But what you do in moderation, they'll do in excess. So if you can take it or leave it a little church, listen, they're going to leave it more than they take it. Make your family a place where you can pass down. I preached about this morning. You're building a life, but you're leaving a lineage and legacy. What are we going to leave behind? Make this, man, when they talk about dad, let them talk about dad who loved the Lord. I'm talking about mom who loved the Bible. I love the fact that, that Valerie and Julia both will tell you uh, fond, precious memories of their mother and father and their love for the Lord. Listen, I, I can also get some of you to stand up and tell about the abuse you suffered at the hands of your father and the abuse you suffered at the hands of your mother. So whatever your background is, if it's a good background, thank God, praise the Lord, continue that blessing. If it's a bad background, stop it in this generation and start a channel of blessing so that your children and grandchildren can say, Grandpa made the change in our home. You're not living for it right now. You're living for your children and your grandchildren. And that keeps you thinking, you know, it's not about right now. It's not about this moment. It's about tomorrow. So I better get my problem fixed now because this is going to carry on through tomorrow. Joshua made the statement, very familiar. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve. 
whether the gods of your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites and the land who dwell, whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What he was saying is, listen, you make your own choice. And by the way, that's what a pastor says. Make your own choice. Can't make you. Don't want to make you. Make your own choice. But I really hope you see the value of saying, I'm going to serve the Lord. I think about we have several missionaries tonight. You know, don't feel sorry for them one bit. Don't you dare feel sorry for them one bit. Their kids will see a whole part of the world and a whole part of the work of God that your kids won't. You, you thank God that somebody said, you know what, whether it costs us comforts of home, uh, family, relations, whatever, we're going to serve God. Those, if they do it correctly, and we pray they will, if they do it correctly, those children won't be bitter. They'll be blessed because mom and dad said we're going to serve God. What's the family for? Well, it's a place to eat, it's a place to sleep, change clothes, get laundry done. No, so much more than that. God designed the home. It's a shelter. It's a place of refuge. It's a place of teaching, instruction. Dads, it's, it's, it, moms, it's, it's time-consuming to stop and say, look, here's a lesson. Let me give you a lesson. It's one thing about the dinner table. Take the lessons of the day. Teach them to your children. Use those illustrations, object lessons, stories. Father, I pray you're blessed tonight. I pray you'd help us. We've had a lot in the past week on the home and family. Thank you for that series, that conference. Lord, as we continue now, I'm, I'm burdened. There's so many young families not here tonight. And uh, Lord, it's just the day in which we live. There is a take it or leave it attitude. And so many times we look for excuses not to be here when we should be looking for reasons to come. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just help our homes. Uh, we're under such direct assault and attack. Pray for our dads. I think the, the foot, uh, the, most of the problems lies at the foot of the father. I pray, God, that you'd help our dads, our moms, love you, love each other, and, of course, invest their lives in the children. Bless, I pray. Thank you for the encouragement tonight from Brother Brent. And, uh, Lord, the, the need for missions, the need for the word of God printed. Lord, prepare our hearts as we enter into missions conference. So, Lord, maybe one of these children, 4 to 14, maybe one of them, ones that stood on the stage tonight will give their heart and life surrendered to the call of Christ to world missions. We pray now you bless Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. If the Lord is dealing with you, speaking to you, listen, Dad, it starts right there with you. What you make as a priority is what they're going to make as a priority. If, if mom, if you're not following dad, or if dad is not leading, mom, you got to make it a priority. Young people, give your dad some room. He's growing. Give your mom some room. She's growing. Heads about eyes are closed. Folks are coming. Why don't you use some time tonight? Pray for your husband, your wife, your family. If you're a single individual, praying for yourself, whatever God has you to be. If you're here tonight and you need to pray with somebody, our folks are available. Well, listen, we, we're just trying to encourage the home. Mom, dad, husband, wife. We want God to have a channel of blessing in that home. Mark leads us. Folks have come. You step out. You come. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly fervent. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all holy altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice made? Your heart does the spirit. and contentment always. You must do His sweet will to be free from all ill. On the altar your all you must lay. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice lay? And have peace 
set streets rest as you yield him more body and soul. Oh, we never can know what the Lord will bestow of the blessings for which we have prayed. Till our body and soul he doth fully control and our whole on the altar is laid. Is our whole on the altar a sacrifice laid? Our heart does a spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you Look up this way. Thank you, Brother Mark. Look up this way. We have a few announcements. We'll give uh, Usher just a moment. If you're a member of community, be faithful in your giving tonight. And if you're a guest, thank you for being here. We ask nothing in the offering uh, other than if you have that uh, visitor card, like a record of your visit. Right after church, we're going to have a 226 meeting. If you're in ministry 226, we're going to go to Barnard Hall. That was originally scheduled for uh, the Courtright House, but they have a sick uh, young man there, little Elijah, uh, just been real sick this week. So we're going to move that 226 meeting to Barnard Hall. Brother Dan, let's let's not have our let's not have that Sunday school teachers meeting because of that meeting. I don't want the conflict there. But uh, next Sunday night there'll be a Sunday school teachers meeting, and uh, we'll go over that. So Barnard Hall for 226 right after church tonight, and uh, we'll have a quick meeting explaining some things about dealing with our children. Father, bless the offering, the gift, and the giver. We ask you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you as you give. If you're, if you're around in the afternoons at the church, we have a bunch of the young people take lessons at Nancy Davis's, but uh, they'll be practicing. They'll be in here in the auditorium. They'll be in Barn Hall. They'll be over in the cube. And uh, so there's always playing. And I just love that, Emily. Wonderful job. Thank you. I need to see the following folks just for one second immediately. I mean, like five seconds after we dismiss all of you that I'm going to call come right here. Uh, Floyd, uh, Nor let's see, uh, Stephanie and Wayne. Deanna and Garth, Alan and Sarah, Rick Boswell, uh, David and Brooke, uh, let's see, Dot and Jim, uh, Richard and Anna, Matt and Rebecca, Lois and Bob, and uh, my friend from North Carolina. That's what I thought. I had no idea. All right, so if I could see y'all for just a minute right here, uh, I'd appreciate it. Just one second right there. Uh, and then announcement, uh, we have... Uh, coming up Tuesday is our Chick-fil-A Breakfast Club, 930. Does not have to be a senior citizen. If you want to come, just have Bible study with us. Uh, Saturday, Brother Keith, where are you at? Brother Keith is hosting the Men's Prayer Breakfast Saturday, and uh, that's at 8 o'clock. We're going to have a great time. You come and bring somebody with you. Bring a lost friend with you. Bring an unchurched friend with you. Bring a church friend with you. doesn't matter, but come 8 o'clock and we'll say more about that. During missions conference, we need some extra help in the nursery, some rocking grannies. Mission Conference kicks off Tuesday the 12th with our lunch, and this is going to be the biggest lunch we've ever done. 
going to have a great time introducing you to missions and missionaries. I'm just looking forward to that. And the conference starts on the 13th. And then if you can help Brother Paul, Boca Siega High School, during school hours. Now, if you're staff, uh, you don't need to pray about it. You've already prayed about it, all right? So all our staff is involved. And we thought about the number. If we can just get our staff, there's a good dozen or so uh, that we can get. But if you can help us during school hours, you see Brother Paul, he'll give you the things necessary uh, about getting involved with that. But we're going to just go in, and all we are are a sounding board trying to help young people make decisions. If they ask, we can talk to them about the Lord. But uh, we're not going in to necessarily witness. We're going to look for our door, our opportunity. But we're just going to be there to help them with some life issues. How many of you remember that 16, 17, and 18 were hard? That's what they're going through. Many of these don't have parents. They don't have this family unit to go run to so we're going to try to step in there our easter outreach we're going to try to get out 10,000 invitations the two three weeks prior to easter and then just pray for david he's starting cancer dots doing all the prelims for her stuff um we've got several things going on physically this week so let's pray for folks uh, and then the men's advance mark your dates for april 12th and 13th anything else all right let's stand together good to have you folks going to Africa, good to have you sir visiting back with us. Uh, Brother Brent's back in the back. Go by First Bible. Talk to all these folks. God bless you. I love you. If I called your name, meet me right here. Other than that, you're dismissed. (laughs) 